Good afternoon, good morning. Welcome to my presentation about the Smart Component Library. Smart Component Library is the developer framework from consulting work and yeah, I would like to give you a, an overview of the features and capabilities of the framework. Few words about uh, consulting work. Uh, we are an IT consulting organization. We are primarily providing consulting services to companies that develop software at OpenEdge application partners of Progress Software, ISVs, or direct end customers that develop software for their own purposes. Um, our main office is located here in Cologne, in Germany. Uh, we do have uh, an office in the United Kingdom, an office in Romania, with colleagues working from home office in the Netherlands. We're supporting customers almost all around the world from there. Um, we're a vendor of developer tools like the Smart Component Library, and we provide consulting services with or without the Smart Component Library. We have Progress Software Service Delivery Partner, so in many, especially in modernization projects, we do work very close together with Progress Software. Um, I believe there are a couple of areas where we have just a very good reputation. For many years, we've been probably referred to as the go-to guys for GUI4.net. Um, and uh, well, we also have experience in Angular for building web application, or mobile application, object orientation, application architecture, and well, things like that. And all that stuff that we use in application modernization projects. My personal role within consulting work is I'm, I'm the director, but I'm also supporting our customers as, a, as an architect in modernization projects. I'm the product manager, architect, and also developer of Smart Component Lab in the WinKit. Um, well, a lot of time with object onto design, software architecture in general. Um, I would say I'm an experienced desktop user interface developer and I have enough knowledge about web technologies to ask dangerous questions to our web developers. I'm using Progress for over 30 years myself. Um, yeah, it should be enough for now. Um, that's quite a long list of products from Progress software that we provide services for. I um, mean, the list is constantly growing with all the new developments and acquisitions from Progress Software. Um, one of the most recent things that we gather experience in is WhatsApp Gold for infrastructure, network, and application monitoring. We're using WhatsApp Gold, for instance, in our own office for something as important as monitoring how much coffee is there in the central coffee pot in the office. So we have scale there, and when the scale says, oh, two less coffee, then we get email alerts through WhatsApp Gold just to try out that it works. A um, couple of other products that we provide services for um, in the context of OpenEdge usually. Uh, Protop for monitoring databases. Combit is a very commonly used, um, it's not a reporting solution, but a tool that you can use to provide the output for reports for web frameworks like Angular, .NET, Java, Elasticsearch, my brother will be giving a presentation this afternoon on how to use Elasticsearch together with OpenEdge, and so on and so on. So let's start looking what, talking about the Smart Component Library. So it's a framework for developers. But what is a framework? Let's start with that. Um, different companies, different, well, relevant companies in the IT industry have a completely different definition of framework. Microsoft says we have the one.NET framework, or maybe four different editions, or whatever, but there's the.NET framework. If you'd be a developer of Apple iPhone applications, for a single application, you'd probably be using 30 different frameworks, because Maps is a framework, and Payment is a framework, and whatever, everything is a framework. Um, so it's a completely different definition of framework. So and for the Smart Component Library, it's also something that has grown over time. Um, I would say in the, in the core of building a framework is um, a proven methodology for writing applications. So we have a certain um, way how front ends and back ends work and behave and we have adopted that over various UIs and um, we're not maybe the original inventor of these things. There have been similar ideas before, but in general that is a proven methodology of writing applications that we provide with the Smart Component Library. Then we have templates that, that make it fast to build applications that way. Tooling, developer tools, code generators, for instance, APIs and base classes that just reduce the amount of code that a developer has to write. 
We have uh, runtime components, maybe on the UI, things like a filter or login screen or message screen, or whatever, that uh, would be used as we provide them or maybe with customization um, to provide a quick start into building application. Um, in the, well, let's say, the second half of the lifetime of the Smart Component Lab, the Smart Component Lab is now 12 years old since the first release. The whole topic of DevOps and tooling for testing, building, deploying has become more and more important. And uh, we have tools for that. We also always try to be a step ahead of the demands of our customers. Um, so we always try to imagine what could be maybe integrations or challenges that our customers could be asking us in the near future maybe new, UI, new, new UI technologies um, as um, that, for instance, we have investigated, um, like Nick Finch showed in his talk yesterday, using Blazor with OpenEdge, um, Blazor, Razor, Microsoft's latest UI technology, um, and process of planning or prototyping and planning um, a force UI technology for the Smart Component Library in addition to GUI4.net Angular Web and Native Script Mobile. Um, we provide maintenance to the Smart Component Library. Um, part of the support and maintenance, we are uh, well, to provide formal support for every new version of OpenEdge within 30 days after the release. So, which is sometimes funny, like when in the, um, OpenEdge 12.4.1 and 12.2. Seven, no, yeah, 12 to 7 are released at the same time of such a conference and we in parallel we have to start our formal certification process for smart component library in those versions of OpenEdge. So we never want to be the reason why an OpenEdge customer using the smart component library cannot upgrade to the latest version of OpenEdge. That would be really hurting my feelings. We provide QA tools. I mean that's on the edge of the DevOps tools there. We have our own unit testing framework which we didn't write because we didn't like OpenEdge unit in the beginning. We just wrote it much earlier because before the ABL unit was provided by Progress. Um, it's very compatible to that, but it also has certain integrations with our framework um, that make it, for instance, easier to run a unit instead of against the database, against XML files with constant data that, the, that you remove the database contents as a variable from your unit test results. Um, we provide training documentation. The Smart Component Library um, appears uh, frequently, I think three or four times a year, on the training curriculum by Progress Software, and we, are, we do trainings together with Progress. We also do bespoke trainings for customers. We have a set of best practices, goes along with the proven methodology, and an ecosystem of partners or other solutions that, um, that have certain integrations with a smart component library. One, one integration there, is, um, Julian Smith has yesterday in the morning showed his um, um, identity management solution for OpenEdge. And that's, for instance, one of these third party products from the community that just works well with the smart component library. When we talk about applications, yes, there are also always front ends, and front ends are also important. But I just believe that for the future proofness of an open edge application, the back end is just more relevant. Front ends come and go. Um, I'm not as optimistic as Nick was yesterday saying that WebAssembly and Blazor Razor might be the last UI technology we ever need. Especially in the web, every couple of years there's something new coming. So if somebody who now starts building an application with Angular, where we all probably believe Angular is a state of the art web framework, I would not place any bet on the fact that it's still state of the art in five years. But in five years, an open edge backend on a pass OE will probably be a very, very good solution for writing business applications. Um, so that's why we put so much effort in the backend. The backend is boring, you don't see it, it doesn't have the fancy, shiny bling, 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 but it is very important for the application. Um, so we provide various architectural concepts for building applications. Um, 
And in the core of it is very often the business entity. The business entity is a very, very important concept for our framework. We have other components of the open edge reference architecture like business tasks, but they are in the end composed from business entities. We can deal with business entities in a more relational fashion. So get the data if you run a query against the business entity into temp tables and flow data sets. That's something that, well, traditional ABLE developers usually like to see. And we have object relational concepts where we uh, provide the data within a set of objects that we generate for that purpose. Um, the framework is very modular. Um, we can use different components as we need to do that. That's also very important in the context of modernization projects um, because modernization usually means there's already an existing open edge application which is complete. It usually has a lot of functionality. And now we want to modernize some functionalities and maybe as part of the modernization, step by step replace um, functionality of the maybe homegrown or maybe a standard legacy framework with components that we provide. Um, a set of features that has become very important for many of our customers is support, and I would say first class support for RESTful interfaces out of the box. Um, and um, that's something that I'm going to show very soon. The process of designing business entities um, is based on a graphical tool. Um, it's an ABL application written on GUI4.net. Um, it's not integrated into Progress Developer Studio or anything else um, because we want to make it very, very easy for our customers and our customers are ABL developers to use our plugin infrastructure to extend the tool. Additional validation, decisions on naming when you design stuff, um, generating additional code and stuff. So a lot of our customers have been very creative there to extend the business entity designer uh, own functionality. Code generation is also done based on an ABL class. Um, I usually say that when you can use the ABL to generate the most complex financial report, you can also use the ABL to generate something as trivial as source code. Um, we have templates that can be customized. The code generator can be customized that way. Um, and um, we have customers that use that maybe to integrate knowledge from a custom repository of relations between tables or something like that into the design process. Um, and there's an ad hoc based test utility. So that's how it looks. Let's see it live. So I'm going into our tools desktop, starting the business and designer from there. That's an open edge GUI4.net application. Um, has a direct connection to the progress database. And I could start designing a business entity by dragging tables on it. Um, the dialogue that pops up now is also implemented by ourselves as a plugin. So we can enable and disable it or customize it without having to change the whole code base. Um, for index selection, so that's something that we realized when you build business entities based on database schemas, you usually don't need all the database indexes in your temp tables. Too many indexes and in temp tables can actually have a negative impact on performance. I can add multiple tables there, define relations there. When I drag the relation there, it detected the field pairs and um, that's also customizable code. So if customers don't have a database schema where you have um, the same field na names in parent and child table, but you have some sort of a rule for these field names, maybe it would always be sales rep ID, which would be the idea of the sales rep table. Then we can write just three, four, five lines of ABL code to understand that and provide just the fields for that relation. And, and I think that's the power of having such a tool written in the ABL. So the purpose of that is to generate code and in order to generate code I need to define a location. Um, all the other names have already been I 
determined again by plugins so that we don't dictate the names, our customers have complete freedom of names. And once I have provided the name of the package, I'm ready to generate code. The design will be saved in a file called BEDGM. And of course, it's also in very ABL-like uh, content in that file. It's the XML representation of a pro data set that stores this design. There are 10 temp tables in this pro data set and that describes all the things that have been modeled there and I could continue to model there. By doing that, I could be adding fields, custom fields that would be getting um, calculated values um, and I could either write them here in the, in the tool or make it later um, in the uh, developer studio. It's compatible to do it either way, like that. So when I generate the code now, or update the code, because I did already generate the code, I can run it from here in a test utility, which is an ad hoc utility for making queries against business entities. Um, this utility has also proven to be very, very useful if the ABL developers in an organization just write a backend consumed by web developers or by external parties, then the usual testing of, okay, I built a UI with a query and then I test how well the query performs there, it just doesn't work because you're not building any UI. So that would just be extra work. So I can run queries here and we have um, various analytics features here. I would be writing an innocent looking query for customers in the city of Boston. And I would run the query you would say the response looks okay. Um, it did come back in 146 milliseconds, um, but oh shock, it did read 201,000 records. Obviously we're missing an index in the database with this query and I can see that very detailed by looking at the user table statistics. Um, so we see that there were actually 201,000 reads on the customer using the custom index, which probably is not very well suited for filtering on the city field. Um, and this is just very, very important information for the developer as early as possible, um, because now he'd either have to write some query optimization code, which is possible in a, in, a, in a standard way, or disallow this query or discuss with the person maintaining the database, hey, we need an index. But first thing is you need to know that you have a problem. We can define certain validation here um, from a set of validation rules. The list of validation rules is extendable. Um, so we can write application specific standard validation rules very easily. Um, but let's say for the Casper name, we implement just a minimum length of 10 characters. We don't want IBM as a customer because they have a too short name. Um, and uh, we could have a validation message here or leave a default one. Um, we have validations on things like email addresses where if we pick that one, we could check whether the validation includes the DNS query, whether it's a valid um, email domain, so it always checks for valid syntax, but if we say we also want to validate the MX record, then it would actually be doing a DNS query. So when I update the code, this validation now becomes part of the business entity. And I can start using that. Before I start using the code, 
let me show you some other feature. So part of the business entity, it generated the temp table and I could maintain the temp table graphically, see the custom fields that are added there, but I can also maintain the temp table definition here in the source code because we're developers, so we prefer to do that and maybe nobody needs the Telefax anymore and um, phone is probably also an outdated form of communication, so I can just remove fields and maybe I want to translate some fields, so I translate the discount field into German and just save it and either when we reopen the business end here, regenerate it or on direct request, I can refresh the diagram from the include file and what happens is it has detected a new field, Rabat. It cannot see that this is renamed because that's just not there, but it finds the fields which are gone missing now and I can say, hey, it's probably renamed from there. And if I now look at the design, the Telefax field is gone, the phone field is gone, and I now have a Rabat field and the source of the Rabat field is still the database field discount. So now I have this mapping there. And I could either do that graphically or do that just in code, either way. Good. So now let's start making some simple queries. So part of the um, code that we generate uh, around the business entity, we do also generate an object relational mapping um, set of classes around that. We call them the data set models because they're built as a model around pro data sets. Um, we're not hiding the fact that they're built around pro data set because we think that's actually part of the strength of it. So it has generated a customer data set model. I could as easy as creating a new instance of that and providing a value of the primary key. Like that, have access to the name value of that record. No. coming. So now I see the name of this customer um, and I would have access to all the other fields um, and I can also tell this component that I actually want to start keeping track of updates. And I can save that. So that's coming. And what happened to my validation? Did I actually regenerate it after I added the validation on the email address? Probably not. Maybe I didn't compile. <coughs> No, for whatever reason, it's not throwing the error from the validation. That's something I have to look into. Um, not sure what I made wrong. So, but I mean, this is pretty 
easy. We, we don't need a lot of code to access data from the business entity that way to read data. I would also have access to the custom description field that same way. How do I call the field? I'm not working with the right one. Customer description. Okay, I should have access to that field. Um, and um, yeah. So around this, it's very easy to build a reusable set of components with business logic in these business entities and then grow to business tasks and other components like that and, and start writing the backend. Um, you've briefly now seen the current version of the business entity designer um, and the team is extremely busy. Let's close the browser importing the business and designer into the web. So that's an early sneak preview. We've showed an even earlier sneak preview two years ago. That was more like for us seeing whether we can do it. And that's not really a, now a version that we're working on and plan to release to our customers um, in the first quarter of next year. So the business and designer becomes partner of a portal website with a number of tools. Um, some of these tools just provide a lot of insight into the configuration of the app server. So this is all executed on pass OE, so we can inspect the configuration there, search for files. These are typical files that we use um, or any file. Um, we could be trimming app server agents from here, change the logging, change the configuration info. If the PASS OE is uh, a development license and it supports compilation, then we actually can also run custom ABL code. It's executed within the app server. So I could be like that. Um, and, well, the business and designers integrated into that. Um, so we have chosen uh, for, a, for an Angular control, I mean, it's using most of our Angular components, but, but also some specific to this tool um, for that purpose. I can either start dragging new database tables there uh, and, and start building new business entity, or I can open an existing business entity. and open this here. So that's the business entity that we just edited with the custom description, field properties, the calculate field expression that I had there. Um, we can change it from here. I could add fields. Um, I can even generate code from here as well. Um, still lacking a lot of features. Um, currently working on a, on a plugin concept. And one thing that we're working on then together with Jill Carrot is that uh, when a developer of the backend of a web application would be enabled to develop completely in the browser, um, then the next step is to edit the generated code. So we have Will Studio Code in the browser integrated to this and we're working together with Jill Carrot and this, this language server uh, that you'll be showing um, later this afternoon to provide um, a very feature-rich environment to edit source code directly in the browser. So we'll do the code, which has become the standard for development tools for many developers, is actually a browser-based application to start with. So when you run it on a desktop, you just run it in a desktop browser shell, Electron, um, and Microsoft and others um, also provide the Will Studio Code features as a Docker container so that you could run them 
straight from here. So that's something that we're working on and plan to release uh, early next year. Good. So let's move on. So another thing, well, backend is important, but also front ends. I mean, most applications are there to provide some value to the user. Um, we provide various UIs or support for various UIs. Uh, so on the desktop, um, our main UI on the desktop is built around GUI for .NET. So the .NET UI integrated into the Progress client. So it could be dis distributed using the um, client networking or the Progress web client. Um, for web applications, our preference is Angular. Where we have a set of um, Angular components which uh, um, implement the main or the, all the standard functionality of a data entry screen, navigating to records, creating new records, editing records, showing error messages and all that stuff. Um, we use part of the same components for mobile apps in NativeScript. NativeScript is a browser-based no, it's not browser based, it's JavaScript based or TypeScript based framework for web applications. It was initially developed by Telerik and so it became part of Progress Software. Uh, last year, the maintenance of this open source project was passed over to a company that was doing a lot of projects around native scripts, so it's still in good hands. We, we're still using that. Yeah, we're prototyping with .NET, Razor, Blazor. Uh, and we provide various open interfaces that make it possible to use the business logic and the data access from any other application. Um, Atioma, or since two weeks, Build One, partner of ours, uh, has built their framework UI around the smart component library as well, so that there are various UI options. So, but let's look into two of our UI options and how to build a simple UI. The easiest way to start building a UI, especially a simple, straightforward UI, is also from the business end designer. Um, we do have various wizards in the business end designer, and they are all implemented through plugins, which means we can discuss with the customer which code generation functionality they really need, um, and uh, only enable those. Um, one thing that might be interesting for someone like, like Nick Finch is um, we can generate the C-sharp classes that represent the data from here. Um, but of course, for somebody who's not interested in .NET for any UI technology, we don't need this part. So then we can disable this, this feature there. When we say UIs for the desktop and for Angular, we actually have two ways how we can generate UIs or two to, um, to types. We can use the native source code of that platform. So for OpenEdge GUI 4.NET, that would be generating GUI 4.NET classes, which could also be opened in Progress's Will Designer. Um, and um, that has benefits, and but also disadvantages. The altern alternative is we define how a screen should look like in a database, in a UI repository database. Um, the benefit of the UI repository database is the UI definition becomes technology independent. We can render the same UI components to a web page and to the desktop, for instance. If it makes size from, sense from the screen size and lots of standard screens, like standard data entry, works similar well in a browser than it does on a desktop. But there may be other applications that need to be specialized, and that's why we enable this mix. So uh, an application that has very specific UI requirements probably has, I don't know, the usual Pareto rule, 80% standard screens and 20% flexible screens. So we can build the 80% in the repository, quick, easy, very standardized, technology independent, and the 20% which are special, we build them for the visual designer or for whatever Angular tooling is, is chosen. So what I'm going to show you now is the um, UI repository approach using simple wizards from here. When I 
want to build something in the repository, I actually have to log in to the framework. So far, that was not needed. Um, and I'm sometimes asked why for code generation we don't need that. Well, for code generation, we write code to disk. And the protection of that code should better be done by the SCM tool that's dealing with code. So it just doesn't make sense. But when, once we start writing data to our framework database, then we want to know whether the user who's doing that has the rights to do that. So and when I want to build a screen, I just follow four simple to use wizards or dialogues from left to right. I just basically need to provide unique names because it's not the first time that I do this here. Um, define a viewer, I'm just adding 42 everywhere. Select a couple of fields that should be part of the viewer. Create a grid. And then I put it together in a form. And I'm going to reduce the fields in the filter a little bit. I'm going to use the that grid and that viewer. So now that we've generated that as objects in the repository, we can either edit that in our repository UI tooling or I could immediately launch this UI. So and what I'm doing straight away is I'm going to launch that screen from here. We see a very simple screen, the fields that I've chosen on the right hand side in the viewer, the grid here, and the filter. Um, we have um, the ability to update and soon as I start changing records, the grid becomes disabled. Um, we have the filter um, and yeah, very quickly scrolling, we we'll read the data in batches. And I can execute the same screen in the web browser. So I'm now logging in to a similar application which is a static, well, well, which is a production build of an Angular web application running on my laptop too, connected to the same app server. And I go into the dynamic launcher here too. The same screen appears there. And when I execute it there, so it looks different. I mean, it's not meant to be pixel by pixel identical, and then it would not be a nice web application, it would not be a typical desktop application. But we see the same screens, the same fields on the screen, we have a grid, we have the filter, same update process there, same behavior, and when I start making changes here, the grid also gets disabled until I either save or cancel the update of that record. So as a developer, I could now go into the repository tooling and edit that here. It's, it is, we tried a couple of different approaches for this, but this approach, which is looking pretty much like data entry, makes a lot of sense for the definition of the container in an abstract way. We have the list of instances of the objects which are there. Let's see, we have filter, grid, toolbar, etc. Um, I could, for instance, go onto the toolbar 
and change the buttons that we had there, uh, maybe add the navigation buttons to the toolbar too, so that when we execute it again, now we actually have navigation buttons here too. Um, and if I add an appropriate link for that, then we actually see that we have navigation here too. I can jump to the end. So we have 200,000 records. So I can instantly jump to the end and to the beginning without any noticeable delay, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and using that way, we can start making the screens more, more complicated at tab folders, at other UI elements, so at parent-child grids, and so on and so on. Um, the rendering of the UI components that I just mentioned, tab folders, toolbars, buttons, etc., that works pretty much the same between Angular and, and the desktop. What requires some change is um, custom front end code. So when we write front end code, for this we have to write Angular code, and on the Windows desktop we have to write ABL code for the front end. Um, and that is intended to be like that. If I would have a single language that could be executed in both environments, I would probably do that like that, but since that's not available for us here in the Open Edge environment, um, we use Open Edge code on the front end on the desktop, and we use the Angular code on the TypeScript code in, in the Angular environment of the browser. Okay, let's move on a little bit. Part of the um, oh, design of the framework as being or the framework is designed for integration with other applications. I've seen many other frameworks which are kind of like a black box. Um, what means that if you use the framework then from the login screen to the end of the day when the user closes the application and everything in between, it all comes out of a black box uh, and you either have to use everything or nothing from that framework. The smart component library has not been dealt, developed like that. Um, you can use individual bits and pieces that can run easily side by side with an existing framework and integrate. Uh, one of the first things that we usually integrate are things like the menu, um, so that from this menu of the smart component library, we can also launch the screens of the existing application. Um, we could, for a time in the beginning, continue to use the um, authorization system, so the system that defines which rights a user has in the application from the existing application and later moves that over to using the tools of the smart component library. So in the application framework, the application framework is, is, is part of the smart component library um, that provides, based on definition, features like translation, localization, referential integrity. That's a feature that many of our customers really like to use because the OpenEdge database doesn't doesn't provide that, so we can define between two tables relations and then automatically execute cascading delete, delete restrict, delete nullify, and all these referential integrity rules. With a batch scheduler, we can run jobs repeatedly or just now, uh, which is also a great solution for long running jobs. The app server should not be used for those, so our batch scheduler is a much better, better tool for that. Quite a number of security. Um, security being well, authentication so who is the user and authorization what is he allowed to do um, so we barely work with all the features of uh, PASOE and the spring framework there but also yeah, third party solutions like uh, Securable from Notable um, or Bronco Ostermeyer from Flusso has uh, specialized on using Keycloak um, which is another identity provider and we have successfully used all of them with the Smart Component Library for various flexible authentication solutions. Smart Component Library is written in the ABL2. Um, so if we take the Angular UI by side, um, I think I need to count the lines there. Um, I think we now have um, 
a noticeable amount of TypeScript code there. Um, but for everything on the desktop and our tools, really the majority of that is ABL code. We ship the source code to our customers. Uh, we provide new releases almost weekly. Um, and um, yeah, so we have our own strategy around how to deal with the various open edge releases. We support the two LTS releases um, and currently 12.3 and 12.4. A couple of weeks, 12.5 will be released, then we will probably drop support for 12.3 relatively soon because I would assume that those who are not on the LTS release will be on the latest non LTS release of OpenEdge quite quickly, and so on and so on. Before we go to the mic, I just realized that I have forgotten one feature that I definitely wanted to show, and that are the RESTful interfaces. Um, RESTful is a standard, well, not really a, a formal standard. Um, it is a um, way of writing JSON REST interfaces with a certain semantic. Um, and developers of front ends or integration solutions, so front ends which are not our Angular front ends, they don't need to use that, but others, just like these RESTful interfaces. Every modern application that provides interfaces these days are doing that in a RESTful way. Um, so yesterday, when I had the error handling sample of dealing with errors from Jira, we were to also utilizing Jira's RESTful API. And a lot of developer tools, but also business applications have APIs in the same way. And what this semantic means is using certain URLs, we can access data from the business entities. So that's the business entity that I have developed long before. Um, so it has now the address slash customers. The slash customers address is being realized by this REST address annotation on there. Annotations are a way of providing meta information within the source code. Um, the ABL has a language construct for the annotations. There is no built-in way of making use of annotations at runtime, so we had to build our own tooling for that. Um, but now that we have that, we don't need to generate any REST resource or whatever. We just need to have a business entity with those annotations, and the rest is handled by the, by the framework. And within our REST, I can have a list of customers. I can also write queries against that, like the city equals Boston, no? uh, not Boston, Boston. Um, I can add more than that. I can define the fields. So let's do name, custom, um, city, country, address, for instance. And I'm getting the fields from that list back. The, the idea behind that is I'm, if I'm writing a client application, maybe for a mobile phone, the developer of the mobile phone application knows better than the backend developer which fields are required for a certain request, and that can save bandwidth in those areas where it's critical. Um, we see here in the browser clickable links. There are two types. I'm coming from a list of records. I can click on an individual record, and that brings me to that, the details of that record. And we have links which are annotated with a relation. So we have a link to the orders of that customer, the open orders of that customer, or the sales rep. And I can click on it. And in the browser, I can basically navigate through all the data. I can get the details of that order. 
And we see in the address bar the orders of a customer has its own address. It's customer slash customer number slash orders. And an individual order is then the numbers appended to that. And when I click on that, then I get down to the order lines. And so it's a very straightforward way of navigating through data. In the same way, this RESTful also allows all sorts of updates. So I can create new records. I can update existing records. I can replace an existing record. So there are two different ways of updates. Replacing means I need to provide all fields. Updating is I just change a couple of fields. And I can delete records. So and for allowing developers to test that, we have provided integration with a tool called Swagger or OpenAPI. Um, Open OpenAPI or Swagger is a tool designed to provide documentation and testing for these RESTful applications. So if I look here for the endpoints of the customer business entity, then I see all the operations that this business entity provides. So getting, getting a thing, um, updating um, records, creating new records, on all that stuff. So all the CRUD is provided, and it's only provided through these two annotations there. So, well, that was country CS customers. So now let's click on the details, and we see this address has a parameter custom. And I can try it out and execute it from here. And now I'm getting the results of that record. Um, I can also try any of the other operations from here. So I could do the patch. Patch allows me to update individual fields of a record. And earlier I have seen a value of a certain field, so let's try this. And by providing a correct JSON structure, here in the argument, so maybe removing all those periods, and execute that request. I get a response which here says update was successful. If there would be a validation error, that would be returned here. And now I can test that if I read the record from here. I see that the update has really been persisted in the database. Um, so that's um, very easy to use RESTful support only through those annotations in the source code. Where basically say, hey, what are the what is the address there, which fields should be provided by default, and so on and so on. So let's briefly then talk about migration tools. So we have tools that support developers by analyzing existing source code. And we use Propass, um, which was also mentioned by Jill Kerre in the Capel. Um, presentation. Propass is a tool which analyzes progress code and makes it easy consumable for programs. Um, it translates code in an abstract syntax tree, and I'll show you how the abstract syntax tree looks like in a second based on an actual tree view control in, in, in a .NET UI. And with that, we can analyze existing .p or .w files and understand them. We, we can understand what frames are defined there. We can understand what event handlers are there. We can try to understand what looks like validation code. Um, and because ProPass understands everything from the ABL, um, and we keep our version of ProPass up to date with every new keyword in the language, um, but for looking at existing applications, new keywords aren't that relevant. We won't find keywords which will be introduced in 12.5 in 30-year-old applications. It's just a matter of fact. Um, but anyway, we, we support them. Um, then we mix the structure of the source code with some understanding of certain patterns in the application. Um, what does that mean? If we find a fill-in 
and a button next to the fill-in. And the fill-in has a leaf trigger and the button has a click trigger. And maybe the click trigger of the button triggers the leaf of the fill-in. Then we assume that looks pretty much like a lookup control. And then when we translate this into one of our UIs, then we don't translate that into an individual fill-in and a button, then we use our lookup component. So that's a UI pattern. Another pattern is stuff like update editing statements from the dark, dark histories of the ABL, but still around. Um, they contain a lot of validation, and um, there is also a typical code stand with this if, go, pending, or whatever, last key is whatever. Um, that is something which, which we then can interpret. Um, that allows us to separate business logic from UI logic, um, and we can combine business logic from multiple screens, not scripts. Uh, well, some, some screens are creepy, um, into a single business logic object. So if I say, hey, I have three data entry screens for the customer record, but in the new application, I want to have just one component that knows how to validate a customer, then we can merge that together, try to avoid redundancy. Um, we can translate UI logic into cross-platform APIs. We have a lot of individual features there, and they're growing, not really daily, but constantly. I'm not going to tell you that anytime soon we have the one push button solution that converts TTY applications into something new, but this is a tool set that makes it very developers to get close to there. And I mean, even if we improve migration projects by 25%, that's still a significant time saver um, and allows developers to focus more on other things. And it depends a lot on the kind of application. ADM2 or dynamics-based application, which we know very well, um, we can achieve a much higher conversion ratio than for non-standardized, pretty ugly, every developer did his own thing based on the day of the week, .p files. Um, so the, the quality of the applications really depends there. Um, um, and we've used that, those tool sets for a lot of projects and yeah, Dynamics ADM2, um, DWP is, I refer to that as a legacy framework, not really maintained anymore. Um, we're currently preparing similar tooling for the ProShield framework. Um, the very helpful thing there is that the former developer or maintainer of that framework is very helpful here, provides us lots of, lots of insight in that framework. So I just want to give you a very quick demo of what we can do with that tooling. Um, so that was a TTY update editing. Um, so there is then validation on the country and when the country record is found, it will display the country name and the same with the sales rep record there and maybe also with others. So let's go into the tool for that. So from our developer desktop, I go into the tool to graphically visualize the ProPass, and I must admit, this tool that I'm going to show you now in this way, is it, it's mainly for demonstration purposes. Most of that tooling does not have a fancy UI. So we run a .p that turns some other .p through a mill and does something with it. So, but if I open this update editing sample, then we see on the left-hand side the tree structure. And in the tree structure, for instance, we see if equals a widget reference to a quoted string, if session display type equals GUI. So we see some statements from the middle out. So the, the AST makes the equality comparison being the parent of the left and right term and stuff like that. But that's basically the tree that we can analyze much easier than that dot p file. The tree has already all of the abbreviated ABL keywords being expanded. All database field names are expanded and we know they belong to and stuff like that. So um, 
there's not a lot of guessing required anymore. I mean, we need to recursively go through a tree and yeah, okay. So, especially for the update editing statements, we now here have code that just looks in this program for the update editing block. And I switch to that, so it has now selected one of the update statements there, and I can show it here. Um, so an update with an editing block starting with a read key, and then we have this go pending or old field or whatever, next prompt statements. And um, most of the update editing code, yes, yeah, a different complexity that I've seen, they all followed the old progress books. They all look so similar. So that makes it easy to write a pattern or to understand a pattern. So I can now convert that. And what's now happening, it's looking for a compatible business entity. And it has now translated the actual validation rules out of that code block. into validation rules that I could put into a business entity. So we see here if the input of customer name equals empty string, and up there we see if eCustomer, which is a temp table, customer name equals empty string, then instead of having the message statement there, we use our API to return the message to the front end. Let me go to the next one, find sales rep. So that was here. Um, if not available, so, um, trying to find the record of not available. So the code on the right hand side, I can copy and paste that now into a customer business and it, and it will do the same validation. So we can do these things if we know how the left code looks like. Um, writing that routine is, is a matter of a couple of hours to a few days um, of based on knowing those patterns. And that provides a certain benefit during um, modernization and, and, and refactoring code through harvesting. Good, with that, I'm coming to my end. Are there any questions? Daniel? Good, well then thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. <laughs>